Hello everyone. Welcome to Microsoft's webcast series. Today's webinar is Don't Do This in Microsoft Project. For years we've been telling you what you should do in Microsoft Project and even showed you a few tips and tricks. When was the last time someone told you what you shouldn't do? My name is John Wagner and I'm going to be your moderator for this exciting webinar. We are very excited to share with you some of these best practices. As we get started, let me tell you a little bit about the versatile company. We've been in business for over 25 years, helping our clients improve their project results. How do we do this? We do this in a multitude of ways. First, we do this through training. Our classes help build practical skills. We deliver training online or on-site to meet our customer needs. Second, our consulting practice focuses on applying proven best practices, including how to get the most from Microsoft Project and Project Server. We can help you deploy and configure Microsoft Project Server or online to meet your business needs. Third, we provide coaching and mentoring service to help you get over those difficult challenges using Microsoft Project, Project Server, and Project Online. We have helped many customers build customized templates, customized views, so they can focus on their business rather than on the tools. We are all about project management, Microsoft Project, Project Server, and guess what? Project Online. We now let me tell you a little bit about our presenter today. Today, you guys are in for a real treat. Our presenter is one of the, the original members of the project team at Microsoft. To give you how long he's been working at, with Microsoft Project, his MCP number is only three digits. And to put this in proper perspective, mine is seven digits. He joined the Versal company in 1996 and in Simpson has developed a following of professionals that want to get the most out of Microsoft Project. He is a certified project management professional, a Microsoft certified trainer, Microsoft certified IT professional, and in annually since 2010 has been awarded the prestigious Most Valuable Professional MVP designation by Microsoft in recognition of his contribution to the worldwide project user community. Now this is not an award that you take a test for. It is bestowed upon you by your colleagues. You earn this award based upon your contribution back to the project community. And in, to put this in the right light, there are about 50 project MVPs worldwide and about 15 in the United States. And so I'm pleased to introduce to you my friend and colleague, Sam Healthman. Sam, take it away, will you? Thank you very much, John. And hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. Um, on the screen, you can see how to reach out to me. Um, also, how to reach our website and my blog. Please feel free to, to uh, go to the blog, go to the website, peruse it. And if you find something interesting, go ahead and implement it. We, uh, we love it when some of this information or all this information gets utilized um, in project practices. So today, in this webinar, we're going to learn nine mistakes that I've seen again and again in using Microsoft Project. Um, I'm going to be demonstrating these in Project 2016, but you know what? It does not matter. These mistakes are common across, realistically, every version of Microsoft Project that I have seen in my career. I'm also going to show you how not to make them and why you shouldn't make them to begin with. We'll look at how we can get uh, this the best use of this tool without having the problems that are often associated with, uh, with practices. So think of this as be best practices on steroids. I'm trying to uh, help you avoid nine, nine, I think the right way to consider this is in, pardon me, inappropriate practices within this tool. Now, those of you that have uh, worked with me before in webinars know how I operate. If you have not, then uh, let me just give you kind of a brief of what to expect. I like to certainly, as you can see, use PowerPoint to introduce a topic, topic, but then I prefer to go into Microsoft Project and then demonstrate that topic. So um, as we move back and forth, you'll see the screen change. Also, I zoom in and zoom out a lot to make a point. So I'm not trying to make you dizzy, but I will say that it helps illustrate uh, those, uh, those nine problem areas that I just mentioned. 
So the first one is including summary tasks in project sequencing. Changing over to Microsoft Project. All right, here we are. Now, additionally, I'm going to use Project and, and only show one issue at a time. So rather than seeing all of them, what I've got going on here is a filter. So we'll look at these one at a time. Now, summary tasks. Those are the, those activities that represent what's been indented under them. So what you can see here is task one and two belong to the first summary. Three and four belong to the second summary. Won't get into making or creating or designing a project other than to say this is typical uh, outline structure in this tool. And if you are a, a involved in uh, projects to a deeper degree and or are a project professional, we're looking at what is a synonymous to work breakdown structure. So here's the, here's the issue. I'm just going to very quickly create a few links between tasks in this tool. And then make a hypothetical situation for us. In the initial design, we determine that the summary task, the second summary task, must follow the first. And project will allow this easily. You click on the very first summary task, hold down the control key, click on the second one, and then create the link in the task tab and in the schedule uh, sub bar here or toolbar, you'll see the link icon. And as soon as that link is created, there you are. You can see now that one summary task follows another. But here's the dilemma. If any task in another summary level winds up being a predecessor to a task within the second level, project will simply not honor that sequence. It's going to honor this one between the two summary tasks. So here's a flat statement. If you include summary tasks in your sequencing, you may, and most likely will, artificially extend your project duration. Now let me show you what I'm getting at here. Here's that zoom in I was talking about. Here's the hypothetical. You created this and it looks really good, but now you've been asked to examine the project and compress the schedule. In other words, you need to shorten it. How will you do that? You look at your, your sequencing and you determine that this very first task in the very first summary, when it's completed, you could start then the first task in the second summary, this task. So it should be a simple, uh, simple uh, mechanical operation to link the first task with this third task. The problem is it won't be honored. Let me demonstrate. Back out, and I'll just click on one bar. If you didn't know you can do this, you can. I'll drag it to the third bar. And notice that this time period did not, uh, it didn't trigger. It, it simply was not put into the schedule. And again, the reason why, the two summary tasks. Now watch the screen. I'm going to unlink the summary tasks and we'll see this third activity go flying over to the left. Here we go. Click on the summary and unlink it. And there you have it. You saw project now schedule aggressively so that this third activity, activity task three, is now starting earlier than it was directed to when the two summary tasks were linked. Don't link summary tasks. Keep them out of your dependency chain. I think you'll be better off. Let's go back and look at, see what our second one is. OK, so here's number two, assigning resources to summary tasks. Well, you know, this isn't real clear. Why not? Why wouldn't we want to assign a resource, a person, to a summary task for the entire duration of those, of those activities? It sounds logical, 
but boy, is there a problem here. I'm going to get into project to illustrate it. All right, now um, I'm going to go to my second hypothetical here, done via this idea of filtering. So here we go. There. Now, assigning resources to summary tasks. Um, at first, it seems pretty easy. Just highlight the tasks, resource tab, assign resources. And what's wrong with just assigning a resource from here? So I'll assign the very first resource, Carlin. Carly, she is assigned. I'll close it. And you can see those assignments on the right-hand side of the Gantt chart, as you would uh, suspect and which is normal. But notice on the left-hand side of the sheet, that we've got these red indicators. We call this the burning man. And what it means is that a resource is now over allocated, meaning they've got more work to do than their physical uh, eight hour day or 10 hour day would allow. So these are over allocations. And you can see why. We've got two concurrent tasks. So this person currently is working eight hours per day off for two days on each of them. Now, it stands to reason, then, if I took one task and delayed it to maybe the next time period, the week of January 5th over here, for example, that um, I could resolve, that is to say, end the overallocation. So I'll highlight the tasks. And just like in the prior example, I'll link them, which moves one task to the next time period. But they're still overallocated. Notice that in uh, that I've got the work field included in this um, in this sheet, and we can see that uh, each resource is working two days, 16 hours on each day. But if you look at the at the summary task, notice that it's 64 hours of work that's rolled up, and it should, because the resource is assigned for the entire duration of the summary task, which is 32 hours, four days worth of work here, and then assigned to each task, two working days, 16 hours each. So that over allocation will never be resolved, no matter where these two tasks are. As long as they are in the summary level, they'll be over allocated. Now, how do I know that? Well, if you watch very carefully, I'm going to remove that resource from the summary task. Here we go. Do this through the Assign Resources dialog. I'll select the summary task, click on the resource, and tell Project to remove that resource from the summary task. And as soon as I do, the over allocation is gone. The resource is now working on the two tasks, and that amount of work is rolling up to the summary. Assigning resources to summary tasks can artificially increase the amount of work in your project, can create over allocations, and can increase the cost of your project. It's just a bad practice. So avoid yourself the issue. Don't assign resources to summary tasks. Let's get back and see what the next one is. Next on our hit list is leveling resources without any analysis or forethought. OK, so off we'll go back into project. Now, leveling means. Uh, resolving those over allocations like I just did in a Microsoft Project. I noticed that the tasks were concurrent, if you recall. And then I changed the schedule and eventually resolved the issue when I removed my resource from the summary task. But in this case, totally different issue. This is when we have resources and when we have an over allocation, 
it's, uh, it's allowing project to help us. Now, I'm going to go ahead and assign this resource once again, only this time to four concurrent activities. Notice I kept it off of the summary task. No over allocation there. But I've got it on the details, the ones that have been indented. So leveling means making decisions about how to resolve the problem. By analysis, I'm, what I'm getting at is to go into your leveling options. Those exist on the resource tab. Then over in the level commands, there's a a uh, leveling options dialog that lets you look at what options you've got available. So this is the control. If you want to think of the control panel, this is the control panel for resource leveling. Your options are here. So uh, one of the things that we want to figure out is what options do we have available and what do these settings do? I'm pointing them out to you simply so that you can see you have options when you're leveling. And you need to exercise those options depending on the case. Um, some of the check boxes free up a project to be very aggressive. The absence of a check can have a dramatic effect. And this is a big key point in training courses, is to zero in on these leveling options and what they give you provide you, or uh, even better, how to control them. Notice the leveling order here is standard. It's out of the box order. I'll OK that dialog and tell project that I want to level these selected tasks. You don't have to level everything, and you don't have to level everyone. You can be very selective about how you approach this idea of leveling which is to resolve the over allocation. So here you go. I'm going to level this selection. Wow. If you didn't expect that, then, uh, then uh, this, this is the leveling options, or there's a leveling option, I should say, that, that you need to investigate. Um, normally, in, in a normal leveling, we'll see uh, just the opposite pattern. We'll see almost like a stair step or a waterfall. But in this case, it looks like it's almost backwards. Well, obviously, I'm keeping something from you. And what that something is that in my options, I also, for leveling, I also have the ability to apply a priority to a task. So, and, and by that, I, I mean a priority that tells project, don't level this task. It's a higher priority. Level another one. Project will let you have priorities from 1 to 1,000. The higher the number, the higher the priority. How do you see it? It's in plain sight. I'll double click on task 10. And notice that on the general tab, this is task information, on the right-hand side, there's a priority box. The priority of this task is 900. That's an extremely high priority. So we told project. Don't level this task, level other tasks. And in fact, in each of these cases, I gave each a successively lower number so that project would level and show this pattern so I could discuss it with you. So your leveling options aren't only in this dialog that I pointed out. It's also in the manner that you've established your tasks. It's in the manner that you've created your assignments. It's in the work pattern of your resources. There are a lot of factors in play. And to just press a button without understanding what those factors are, well, you can see for yourself. You might get uh, something that you didn't expect and have to go back and find out what happened. Um, oftentimes, I hear a, a complaint about project that um, it's leveling options. No one, you just simply can't understand. And what my takeaway is, you probably don't understand all the options that are available. So don't do this. Level your resources with a little bit of analysis of forethought, and you should have an easier time using the tool. Let's get back to the PowerPoint and see what our next item is.
Okay, so this is a very, very common issue that I see in project. Constraining activities means taking away some of the flexibility and um, uh, some of the dynamic, dynamicism in Microsoft Project. If you're looking for a dynamic schedule, using constraints is certainly not the appropriate approach. We'll get into Project and I'll show you this. So, okay, I'll bring up, I'll filter out what we were discussing, bring up number four, constraining activities. Here we go. Now, I'm going to, uh, in, in this example, I'm going to link tasks and we'll look at some of those dynamic properties. Once a task is linked, um, it will, one task will drive another. So these two tasks are very typical sequence in MS Project. Task 11 is called the predecessor. Doesn't mean proceed. It means it's driving another task. In this case, the finish of the predecessor is driving the start of what's called the successor. That's the task receiving that date. And as we've already seen, tasks can be concurrent. They can overlap. There's a number of strategies that you can incorporate to create uh, sequencing uh, twists and turns and as dynamic as you wish it to be, provided you keep constraints out of your schedule as much as possible. Now, I'm going to choose uh, a constraint for my task 12 uh, when, when we actually select it that is very unforgiving. It wires task 12 into the schedule so that you can see the effect. First, let's look at how dynamic it is. If task 11 here changed its duration to, say, seven days, watch what happens. The schedule busts out to the right, and you can see that it made the calculations of where this, this successor task should be in the timeline. And it did a really good job of it. Then it can work the other direction as well if I choose if I go back to the two-day time period, two-day duration, it'll bring the task right back. So this idea of sequencing and uh, uh, linking activities just it treats this timeline like an accordion. It can expand or it can contract based on decisions that you made about the sequencing type. There are more than just the one we're seeing here. There are actually four types of sequences and the ability to overlap and create lags or gaps in Microsoft Project. Now, this idea of constraining. Oftentimes, constraints can be entered in by just typing in a date. The start and finish fields, folks, are calculated fields. It, what Project is using is the duration of a task and if there are any sequencing, if there are any sequences in your project tasks. And then that is used in, in calculations to determine the schedule. So artificially putting a constraint on a task, occasionally it's necessary. It certainly should not be the rule. So uh, as an example, I'm going to take the current schedule start date for this activity and just copy it, Control-C. And I'll apply a constraint. Double click on the successor. Go to the Advanced tab. And in the middle of the Advanced tab, this is where constraints can be set in the task information. Now, I'm going to choose an absolute constraint. That's a constraint that has the verbiage must start or must finish on a specific date. And this is a really dramatic constraint. It will tie the task into the timeline. Here we go. Must finish on, and then I'll just type in or paste in the date that it's already scheduled for. I'll click on OK, and project will start uh, complaining instantly. I'll click on OK, and it will pop up the planning wizard that says, you set a must finish on constraint. What do you want to do? You want to continue but avoid the conflict? 
I can make it a partial constraint. To make this illustration about constraints, I'm going to allow it. I must finish on a specific date. It says, are you sure? Yes, I am. Now, task 12 is now constrained. I want to show you an indicator that project will put in the indicators field when a constraint is applied. You'll see what looks like a calendar, as you can see here. And also, um, absolute constraints will have like a little red date associated in the calendar. Partial constraints, like start no earlier than a date or finish no later than a date, those will have one end or the other of the task time period, the task duration constraint, but not the whole thing. Must dates can be schedule killers. So now that you've seen it, let's see what happens now when I increase the duration of my task 11 to, say, seven days. Check out how dynamic it is. Look at that. It is not dynamic at all. The task is wired into the timeline. If there were any tasks that were to follow the one that we just constrained, they don't know about the changes. In a unconstrained schedule, they would be pushed out as far as this task. And the task itself would be pushed to the right of the predecessor. So we would see instant changes to the sequence and to the duration of the tasks that are involved. When you wire it into the timetable or time scale, this is what occurs. The task, for those of you that are uh, into uh, further into project management, the task is determined critical, float is removed, removed, and so is flexibility. Constrain activities at your peril. Constrained activities will be honored before sequencing calculations in Microsoft Project. So beware of that. And what you just saw is if you see a lot of these boxes on the left-hand edge of your task sheet, you may have some schedule issues that you're not aware of. So I encourage you to go back and have a look at them. Let's look at the next don't. Here we go. Scheduling projects as late as possible. Well, now, wait a minute. This sounds like something you might want to do, doesn't it? Um, after all, if, uh, if you've got finish dates in mind or the, uh, the participating executives, if they've got finish dates in mind, doesn't it seem to be reasonable that would, you would calculate from a finish date rather than calculate from a start date, which is the default? Well, my answer on this one is a little bit vaguer. And the answer is, it really depends. Now, let me explain that in project. OK, we're back in project. I'll go on to the next item so we can look at it. So here we are, scheduling project tasks as late as possible. And I've got two activities here. Um, and in just a second, we'll sequence them. And as you would normally expect, as I sequence, the, the schedule changes. It's very dynamic after all. Now, that is because I'm scheduling from a start date. If I schedule from a start date, I'm calculating finish dates. And the sequencing is what's going to help me determine those dates. In project information, project tab, project information, we'll see here that we can schedule from a specific date. Let me zoom in here so you can see what I'm talking about. The default is the project start date, but you can change it to the project finish date. By selecting the project start date, project will allow you to actually determine the starting point for calculations. That's what the start date is all about. For you PMPs out there and project professionals, this is determining that we're going to schedule with the forwards pass in calculations. If I schedule from the finish date, though, oh, by the way, look at this. 
scheduling from the start date. All tasks begin as soon as possible. When I schedule from a finish date, the, it changes. It changes to all tasks finishing as late as possible. So the finish dates become the finish date of the project is where we begin to schedule, and project will now calculate the start dates. So, and this is not just any start. This is the latest date, the latest time that a task can begin. So think of this as taking away your flexibility. Some people call this a drop dead schedule, and you can see why. There's no flexibility in it. So I'm going to use the project finish date to show some of the characteristics here as we change a few variables in our little small schedule here. I'll locate the dialog. Yep, I know it will remove. I know it will change things for me, project. But now, my, uh, my scheduling from the finish, as my task increases its duration, like the predecessor may go to, say, seven days, it will schedule out into my normal, it will schedule out into my normal finish date. Let me make it like 12 days. All right. So I'm still scheduling out into the, uh, into the future. Let me make sure I actually change that to project finish date. Yep, I did. And the current finish is um, 117 of 2014. So I'm, uh, this is my project finish date right about here. So I want to show you the behavior now if we see another extension of a task, the extension of, uh, of our predecessor here. Right now it's, it's starting on Christmas Day on 1225. If I increase my duration three more days to seven, I'm going to hit that project finish date, and project is now going to recalculate start dates. Notice the start date went from Christmas to the day before. And as I increase this maybe two more days, we can see that the start date is now being calculated, not the finish date. So we begin to see calculations going the other directions. What I'm saying here is that you'll see the, uh, the durations extend this way, which many people don't expect, don't understand, or are just simply not prepared for. It's quite often that we look at durations, we, we look at projects, we think of, boy, I want to know on my finish date, I want to know exactly the latest that I can start my activities and still make my finish. But if you're scheduling but with this method, just bear in mind that there's no, there's no slack here for you. There's no um, a bailout mechanism. Everything is as late as possible. All possible flexibility is gone. And um, if, you, if your project date becomes untenable, then it's really the design of the project and the method of scheduling that was chosen so that you're not even seeing potential candidates for redesign. My advice, when you, at least in, the, in the, the starting period, the starting dates, when you're beginning a project, make sure that you're scheduling from the project start date so that the behavior that you expect is the behavior that you get. Project takes the start date of the project and moves forward. Also, uh, and, and kind of a corollary here, if your project started earlier than the current date or the date that's uh, being displayed as a start date, you'll want to change your, your project to that date so that you can capture the historical information if you need to without uh, getting error messages about a task being, uh, being started before the current start date. I think this will be a, a very advantageous for you to keep this in mind as you uh, try your, your tricks in scheduling here. Let's go look at the next one. OK, so this, in, this next uh, of, of the nine that we're looking at, this is um, 
I don't want to say exactly that it's devious, but it can certainly be uh, deceptive. It is inadequate baselining in the tool. Now, what do I mean by inadequate baselining? There are a lot of methods, many different methods of baselining. You can baseline a single task. You can baseline phases. You can baseline the entire project, if you wish. And what happens in project is that the scheduled information is copied into baseline information. So um, each start and finish date, as an example, is copied into baseline starts and baseline finishes. And those fields are static. They don't change. The calculations for them don't change. Now, that can create a problem when it's time to look and try to consider changes that have occurred in the project. So the idea of status is trying to understand what's happened between what really happened in the project and what you wanted to have happen in the project. So it's comparing baseline to actual information or to schedule information where we start to see the real value here of understanding this idea of a baseline. Let me demonstrate some of this in Microsoft Project here. Here it comes. And I'll filter out this to filter in the baselining. By the way, this is an excellent excellent method of focusing a team on a specific group of tasks instead of having to see the whole project. It's just to use your auto filtering in the tasks and select the ones that you want to show. And you can then filter out all the rest that you don't need to focus on. So here I've got two tasks. And um, once again, I'll create my sequence. Looks good. And now to set a baseline. Project tab, set baseline. And I'm going to set the baseline for just these selected tasks and roll the information up to the summary so we can see a baseline at the summary level as well. Here we go. Now, if you don't see this, then on the View tab, I'm sorry, on the Format tab, Go to your baseline bar styles and turn it on so you can see it. And here you can see, well, we've got a baseline in place. I guess I didn't have it selected. Let me re-baseline here so I know that I've got all, everything selected here in my, in my view here for you. Project tab, set the baseline for the selected tasks, and we should see the baselines pop up. There we go. So, um, so here we've got a baseline in effect. Well, things happen, and um, we can wind up with a modified schedule. So, for example, durations can change. Here's one. We'll change it to four. And instantly, we see that push. We see that the predecessor pushed the successor out in the timeline. And the larger the push, the bigger the difference between uh, what we want wanted to have happen versus um, that which is here the baseline and what is currently happening, so this pushback. Now to see this in a project, it's called variance. So the difference between where we wanted to start a task here we go and where we currently start it that's called variance. Notice that in the first task there isn't any any. But in the second task, you can see that there is, because it was pushed. So the difference between the start here and here, that's called start variance. The differences in the finish, that's called finish variance. Differences in duration, that's called schedule variance. And you can see most of this by looking at the variance table. Now, how do you see it? View tab. Under the data commands, there's, there's a bunch of tables, and one of them is called variance. And it's here that we can begin to see the variance begin to pile up. Starting variance of four days. So that's what we're seeing over here. I'll bring it back in. And finish variance of four days. So you can see that now and understand that 
that uh, those numbers are simply meaning that the tasks start and finish are delayed. So in project, I should say in many organizations, the idea of having variance implies some idea of maybe a level of failure of management or failure of the project manager. And so I see this, and I see this unfortunately quite often. Oh my gosh, I've got all this variance, and I've got a meeting I have to attend to show my status. I'll just highlight these guys. Go into my set baseline and reset those tasks. It will caution me. It's already been set, but here I go. Now my variance, if in case you didn't didn't get that far in the logic here, my variance is reset because my baseline is reset. You know, there's legitimate and good reasons to modify a baseline. Um, acts of God occur. Uh, you know, storms, hurricanes, power outages. Um, also, a legitimate reason to rebaseline may be that a, uh, a fire or a strike occurred. But rebaselining just to keep the variance to zero is not a legitimate reason just to baseline. Let's look at the next item. This is a dandy. This is using elapsed durations for team schedules. Now, an elapsed duration is a, uh, think of it as span time. That means that the duration is continual. There's no working time involved. It's simply running time. Let me give you an example of that and why you shouldn't use it for uh, team schedules. And that is to say for the human schedule. Here we go. Once again, I'll modify this so we can have a different look. Let me go back to my standard table, which is the entry table. We can see it here. Now, for your, our purposes here, I, I put the work field right next to the duration field. And I'm uh, using a three-day duration on two tasks. On one task, it's a normal duration. When you look at it, you'll see three days. But for the second task, used three elapsed duration, three e, -D e days. And you would enter this with a three and then an E and a D. Project knows then that we're talking about elapsed duration. Also, notice on our, our schedule that a three-day schedule starting on a Friday means we finish on the, on the afternoon of Tuesday. That's a working duration. But on our it starts on Friday and ends, at, uh, ends on Sunday. I'll apply the same resource to both so that we can look at what happens in terms of effort over here in the work field. Here we go. I'll assign Carly. Now, check out, check out the amount of work. Three working days, three eight-hour days, 24 hours. Three elapsed durations, three elapsed days, is three 24-hour periods, or 72 hours. So assigning a resource to an elapsed duration means 24-7, folks. So humans, probably not a good idea, unless you want to burn them out, to put them on to uh, an elapsed duration. But some other types of resources, it's fine for, like cranes, you know, big pieces of equipment that can be scheduled for uh, a 24-7 period. So here's the deal with the, these elapsed durations. You've already seen one elapsed day is 24 hours, a working day is eight, a working week is five days, five working days, 
a working, or I'm sorry, an elapsed week is seven consecutive 24-hour periods, and you get the gist. It gets, it can be worse and ever increasing worseness by applying a resource to an elapsed duration unit. Just don't do it. It can create all kinds of problems, mostly personnel, and um, just not be an effective way to lead or to accomplish a goal. On the other hand, um, it be, can be a very useful approach when we're using non-human resources. Let's look at the next. OK, we're, we're closing towards uh, some of our last uh, uh, techniques or scenarios here. This one is an incorrect calendar association. And to better explain it, I can, I can explain it better in project. So I'm going to go on over there, and we'll look at it. All right. Incorrect calendar associations. Project uses calendars for most of its scheduling. Now, what I mean by that is that um, calendars drive the events. Folks, there are four calendars that are possible in Microsoft Project. That means that there has to be some method or some rule for if the calendars um, have exceptions with each other, that is to say, conflict. And the calendars are, there's a project-based calendar. There is another type of base calendar, most often used with resources. So think of it as a shift calendar, like, for example, four tens or part-time. There's a resource calendar for, for people so that we can capture their, their time off or their holidays. And the last type, and often not known about, is called a task calendar. That's right, a task calendar. So let me show you what I mean by this. Here we've got um, two tasks that are um, you know, in a normal relationship, finish to start type of sequence. But in the indicators field, for the successor, there is an icon. There's an indicator. And what it's saying is, Hey, there's a calendar assigned to this task. Quite often, I'll, uh, someone will, will reach out to me and say, hey, I've used a, a task calendar because I have a very limited time period that a task can be completed. And so I'm using a task calendar to wire it to the schedule. Now, this would be in the absence of a constraint. Here's kind of the behavior or some of the behavior that you might expect from a task calendar. I'll increase my duration to five more days to make it a six-day schedule. And, you know, project pushed it into that following week. If I make it a larger change, like, for example, a nine-day duration, well, again, project can, can schedule it. It makes it, it looks pretty good. Whoops. Excuse me, I'll pop back here. And eventually, we'll begin to see something else occur here. Here's 12 days, um, maybe 20 days. Uh-oh. Project scheduled it all right, but look at what it did. It pushed it out two more, two full weeks. Well, that, this is a, ca a task calendar and the effect of it. Now, I want to point out where it is, and then we'll look at the calendar as to what it did. Double click on a task. It's got a task calendar. And again, on the advanced tab, right smack in the middle, you'll see this calendar has a specific calendar. It's called Thursday's calendar. We'll look at it in a moment. I want to point out something else about these calendars. This is a checkbox that says, Scheduling ignores resource calendars. It's only when this box is checked that this task calendar will ignore the resources and then, and then schedule wherever that calendar says it's OK to schedule. 
bear that in mind. Resources should drive projects. And here we're saying, no, this task is going to drive uh, at least the resources that are assigned to it. I cancel out so we can go look at the, at the calendar. Project tab, change working time, and here you can see the project calendar is applied if we look at and also notice that that uh, if I go if I were to go back in time here to 2014 and to January and February that these are all working days through the week Monday through Friday are working days when we look at the that Thursday calendar well, here's our time period. We can see that the 9th is a working day, but look at all of the non-working time in that calendar. So this, this calendar, which may be kind of inappropriate for the month of January in 2014, this is driving the task. And in fact, it may be artificially extending the schedule or artificially creating resource problems if that checkbox was checked that I showed you. So ensure your calendar associations are correct in this tool, and it will be a lot easier for you. Um, now I'm going to I'm going to give you very quickly the hierarchy of calendars so that you understand what I'm talking about. The screen's going to go white just for a moment. So here we go. I'm going to draw a square. It represents the project calendar. So all calculations are conducted in that calendar. Looks like it didn't work. So let me just try this again, guys. OK. So there's our project calendar. This contains all of the working days for the business, for the unit, whatever, whatever the case may be. Here is another base calendar that resources can use. There's a square there if it's not showing. Notice that it's smaller. And finally, uh, here's the resource calendar. And then finally, there is the task calendar. Very small little square. Now, the, the strength the bigger the square, the more likely that it's not driving a schedule. So the project calendar, if it's in conflict with any of these calendars, loses. The uh, shift calendar will, will win only against the project calendar. The resource calendar will win when, um, when pinned against the project calendar or the shift calendar. And if the task calendar is imposed on the task with that checkbox that I showed, then it is the Trump calendar. This is the hierarchy of calendars in Microsoft Project. Back to our uh, to our slideshow, and for the last of the nine, organizing projects tasks incorrectly. Well, this gets at this outlining uh, uh, capability again within the tool. Let me just demonstrate this really quickly. There we go. Here we've got an, uh, uh, this or idea of organizing tasks incorrectly. And I'm not concerned about the graphic now. I'm concerned about this outline. I have two summary tasks, one called letters, one called numbers. Here you see them. Notice that it's letters that are showing under the letter summary task. But when you look at numbers, notice that there's a letter in there. So when we're talking about roll-up, what, what we're talking about here is that the details of the tasks roll up to their respective summary tasks. So this is what we see in terms of roll-up. So in terms of uh, letters, everything is fine. But numbers, 
not so much. Now we've got a task in numbers that really isn't related. That's this idea of the C year. So when we're talking about roll-up, and this is an important consideration for you, this idea of rolling up the data to the right summary tasks and then so on so that you can report correctly, the roll-up has to be numeric, which is normally correct. You know, project will do this and roll up the numbers quite well. But it also has to have the right context. So if we're talking about numbers, we don't need any letters here. This is, a, this is the incorrect location for this task. In order to correct it, we would select it and then move it up into the letters category. And now our organization is correct. We've not only rolled up numbers, we've also rolled up the context. Um, for our reporting purposes, for visibility, and for logic, just consider that uh, your summary task is the topic or the deliverable, if you prefer, and that everything indented under it is the work that's going to bring that about, that we'll see the final product. Let me go back now to PowerPoint. And uh, John, do you want to you want to talk about this? I'll be glad to go ahead and talk about this. I just want to remind you that the virtual company is about improving your project performance. We have developed a six-panel quick reference guide that walks you through the essential features necessary to plan and manage a project. The quick reference guide should be on every Microsoft project user's desk. This will show you the most practical approach to setting up a project, building a schedule, managing resources, baselining, and, and so forth. This quick reference guide is jam-packed full of great information. We are holding a drawing for the quick reference guide. Just go to www.versalcompany.com forward slash project dash qrg dot aspx. It's also listed on the slide as you see right there. Copy that, go up there, register. Tomorrow morning we'll do a drawing. And Leon, I think you might have a couple of more don'ts. Well, yeah, I do as a matter of fact. So let's have a look at some of these. Now, I've talked about the nine most common don'ts that I see in Microsoft Project. There's many others, but these are the most common. There are some others I'd like you to consider. One is don't confuse duration with work. If you recall, we were we talked about elapsed durations and working durations. That just is how long it takes in the calendar to do work. But the work field, that was labor. Those are two independent variables, guys. Just be aware of that when you're working in project. Second, don't forget your scheduling method. Now, project will let you have, um, as you saw, we can see the, the uh, scheduling from the start, scheduling from the finish. Those are determining how project will calculate your schedule. But there's also two other considerations. One is called automatic scheduling, and the other is manual scheduling. So manual scheduling means just that. You are manually determining your schedule. Folks, this is the default in Microsoft Project. The other, the automatic scheduling, it, project can be set so that that's the default instead. And you can see this in the lower left-hand corner of your project uh, a screen. When you, when you look in the left-hand corner, it will see, you'll see uh, new tasks, and then there's a colon, and they're either auto-scheduled or they're going to be manually scheduled. Uh, if you don't know or haven't chosen either of those, I encourage you, I really encourage you, get into your help files, look for the difference and how to change that default, get training. Again, of course, you've got to expect that from me, right? Training is going to help you control that. And um, just in general, have a... a, a type of schedule that has a better possibility of being the real schedule in your project. Task types. Boy, oh boy. Don't forget about these. 
when um, here's a complaint I hear a lot. Um, hey Sam, uh, my my durations and my tasks are compressing or extending. This thing is is going back and forth like an accordion, and I don't know why. Or I'll hear, hey, my work, the work I'm I'm assigning, or uh, or the resources that I'm assigning to task, the work is just going stratospheric. Or it's reducing to zero, and my duration isn't. I don't understand. So what those are all indicating to me is, an, is an, not an understanding of uh, the second half of the scheduling engine, and that is project's ability to use task types. You can fix a duration. You can fix work. Or you can fix the units of resource. And what that allows you to do is to fix one of those three variables change a second variable, and project will calculate a third. Not understanding task types is uh, not understanding projects, methods of scheduling, and how they interrelate. I encourage you, go into your, uh, into your help file, just type the verbiage task types or changing a task type, and the help engine will jump up and offer that for you. Task types appear when you're in automatic scheduling mode, and they're the most dramatic when you apply a resource to a task. As soon as you do, the task type kicks in, and those variables become very much calculated. Last here, hey, don't forget about effort-driven. What, what that means is that your, your uh, effort on tasks are going to drive the task durations. Task durations and effort control cost and the schedule. So there's a very huge interrelationship here of all these variables uh, affecting what you see when you look at Microsoft Project. Now, all of these are available subjects in your help files. And I, I can't encourage you enough to get into Project and have a look at these. John? Yes, Sam, I am ready for you. Okay. So before we begin answering questions, let me remind all of you that at Versal, our business is what? Improving project results. If your organization wants to improve project management skills, develop more effective standards, or better use Microsoft Project or Project Server or Project Online, guess what? We can help. Now, we've been doing this again for tw over 25 years. Please contact us. Now, to submit a question, please use the question box that we, you have been using very effectively throughout this webinar, because I've been typing away. Uh, and Sam, just as an FYI, if you go to the tab that says Assigned, I've assigned you several questions that I think that you'll go ahead and uh, be glad to go ahead and uh, answer. Go to Assigned. Yeah, there's four tabs, New, Assigned, Highlight, and Search. Mm, the not seeing them, John. Oh, here we go. Got him. Got it. Yeah. There we go. Hang well, on. That was just a... <laughs> uh, Robert says, uh, why would you ever use manual scheduling? Uh, Robert, you're, you're, you're reading my mind. Um, <laughs> let me uh, very quickly here jump into project, folks, so I can give you just a real short um, short look at this. Bear with me just for a moment here. Whoops. Well, let me go on anyway here. I'm going to go back one level here. And then, whoops, I'm sorry. Call this, uh, there we go. All right, so here we are in project. And uh, in the lower left-hand corner, Folks, as I as I explain, here's it's telling us that new tasks, in this case, are auto scheduled. That's because I want to see the effects of changes instantly. I don't want to wait for them. I don't want to have to analyze them. I don't want them. I don't want to incur them manually. I want to. I want project to show them to me. Um, this auto versus manual um, is is uh, is useful when and most often when a resource isn't going to be involved. So Robert, let me give you an example here. I'm going to uh, go to my uh, task tab, and I'm going to very quickly, very, very quickly create a, uh, a 
reporting schedule for, um, for meetings. So here's my meeting. I'm using a recurring task. The uh, duration is, is a zero, meaning I'm simply going to note them every Friday. And I want this for, say, three instances, just so I can demonstrate. I'll click on OK. And project will go ahead and it will um, it'll create my meeting schedule for me. And you can see that it's every Friday now for those three sessions. I'm in auto mode. And in order to accomplish my auto mode, project had to constrain the activities. Even though there's no resources attached to it, it will automatically try to be aggressive and schedule these in, uh, you know, uh, uh, instantly. And in this case, we would see, because there's no sequencing, we just see three milestones on the same day. But because we're asking project to calculate these and put them where they should go in the timeline, it had to constrain them. Now, the alternative to this would be to select, would be to enter the tasks in a manual mode. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to click on project and tell it that the new tasks here are going to be manually scheduled mode. I'll perform exactly the same operation. I'll put in the recurring task. OK. It's still meetings. There's still going to be zero duration they're still going to occur Friday for three occurrences. When I click on OK, notice they're in exactly the same dates as the, um, um, as the auto schedule meetings. But there's no constraints. That's because in these in manually scheduled tasks, there's, there's no constraints. There's also absolutely no task types. And so thus, the, the resourcing in, in uh, manually tasks is not necessarily driving the schedule. You can see here that I got the same dates, but I, I didn't constrain the schedule. I can move these dates around, not affect anything. So when I'm in manually schedule mode, it just gives me some uh, what if capability here within, within the tool itself. So uh, good question. Good question here. Uh, Sud says, what was the second calendar after the project calendar, please? OK. Uh, there are, again, you can have four different types of calendars. There's a project calendar, which is a base calendar. This one is for the project. You can have a, any other base calendar that's, that's generally used for resourcing. And that's, uh, or it can be used for task calendars as well. So this would be a, a base calendar that isn't used for the project. It's used for resources, used for tasks, other tasks. The third is the resource calendar. That's uh, going to have the resources uh, um, exceptions. And then the last would be the task calendar, which I would hope would be a minimal use in your project. So there you go, Seth. Let me look at another question here. Let's see. Sam. Hey, Sam. Yep. I'm, I'm looking at some one of, of the these now. Go ahead, John. Yeah, one of the questions that came in early, and I thought it was a great question, is you were talking about uh, resources and summary tasks. And the question was, can we assign resources only to summary tasks instead of tasks? And I thought maybe it might be good for you to reiterate the point that you were making. Oh, of course. Um, let me uh, uh, adjust my interface just slightly here. OK, so bear with me just a moment here, folks. Here we are, back in Project. I'm going to go back to the resourcing in uh, on summary tasks. Good question, John. Yeah. 
Here we go. So um, if I uh, if I understand the the re requirement here is we don't have resources on our tasks, so I'm going to take them off. We have resources on our summary task, so I'll put them on the summary. Now the resource is assigned to other tasks, so um, uh, that's why we're getting our over allocation here. Um, if your resources are on your summary tasks, and project will allow you to do it, um, you, you picked up on one requirement if you're going to follow this, and that is that no resources are assigned on any other tasks here. But if your resources are assigned on all summary tasks, here's, here's a big question. How will you resolve the overlaps? Um, how do you deal with the details? And how do you in, how do you correct the deficiencies in the schedule or in the over allocation? It may be that you had that the only recourse that you've got is to change the schedule of the tasks, and changing the schedule of the tasks may not resolve that over allocation. So, my my principal um, complaint against that technique is that uh, that it makes it much more difficult to resolve scheduling issues. The second is, if you're trying to get individual discrete reports out of tasks, how much effort it took to conduct, say, task 5 versus task 6, that's not going to be possible because the resource is assigned to the summary, not to the details. Um, if you've got a one-person project, then you, know, you may well want to to, if it's easier for you, why assign it to the summary? But if there's more than one resource, uh, much more um, effective, let's say, in the reporting, if you assign that resource to the detail level. So good question, John. I want to come back here so that we can look at uh, look at our Q and A again. Now. Did you see any more in there that you thought were uh, were that I should instantly answer here for them for them or not? Um, there was a couple of questions around priorities, which one takes precedence, and how does that relate to? Uh, okay, and so forth. I can do that. Uh, I can do that from this screen. So I will just uh, go back to project again. So let me illustrate where the priorities are one more time, folks. In the, if you double click on a task and you go to the general tab, the first tab of the task information dialog, priorities sits on the right hand side over here, right here. You can also have a project priority in, in the case of multiple projects. But what this is telling you is that uh, this particular task has a medium priority. Uh, pr the priorities can go from 1 to 1,000. So having a priority of 500 means it's a medium. That's going to be the default in MS Project on every single task. So if you're going to uh, drive uh, and level your project using priority, then every task will need, uh, in particular, every um, high priority task will need to be manually adjusted to be something higher than 500. Um, if those tasks that can be delayed uh, indefinitely even, if you want to delay them a long way, you could use the uh, uh, lower priority. Using that concept, if uh, you're told, hey, your task is priority number one in project, that doesn't mean it's super high priority. In project, that means that this task can be delayed to December 31st, 2149, whereas a priority of 1,000 means do not level this activity, or if it's project-wide, it's do not level this project. Keep the dates exactly as it was planned. Um, priority is only used in leveling. It does not mean immediacy. It's for you. And it's for your convenience uh, to control that expediency in the leveling of the project itself, the algorithm. Okay, let's go back and see what uh, see what other questions are out there, John.
Let me look up my uh, list here. Oh, here's a question from uh, from Larry. Larry says, can you utilize the resource calendar within Outlook to avoid booking an employee while they are attending non-project meetings? That's a great question. And um, in general, the answer is no. However, however, if you were to um, incorporate in their calendar in project that those were non-working days, then the resource could not be assigned tasks within those specific days. Um, uh, on a secondary note, there are two other tools that are um, corollary, user, corollary uses to MS Project as a desktop app. One is Project Server, in which case you could use the Active Directories and, and uh, also uh, use Project Server as a primary scheduling tool across projects. And the other possibility is to use a SharePoint task list or use SharePoint for synchronization. And in that case, a re resource assigned to a task in a, in a task list in SharePoint uh, can synchronize with their Outlook. Now, it's not fancy. It just simply uh, uh, is a, uh, it's like a control that says, hey, in Outlook, I'm going to tell my manager that I'm done with this activity and synchronization will will occur with the Outlook or I'm sorry with the uh, with SharePoint and Outlook so again it's not fancy your best bet here is going to be in project to have the resource calendar exclude those dates as working days so that no accidental assignment occurs hope that helps let's see what else we got here Sam, here's a fun question. I have, you know, you and I have done webinars for years, yep. and I've never seen this question posed, so I'm going to throw it at you, uh -oh. and it's a fun one, so don't <laughs> worry. Uh, what is your go-to project template? I, I, I saw that. I was like, that's interesting. I, I've known you for, for, for over a decade, and I don't even know what your go-to template is in project. <laughs> well, um, I would say, and to the person that asked this question, I would say I'd like you to clarify if you're talking about my go-to settings or if you're actually talking about a go-to project file template. So let me have about 30 seconds to let you answer that. John, can you watch it? You know who it is? so. I see. Yeah. OK. Uh, another question is, 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 is we're waiting for a response is, can we use prioritization options across multiple tasks from two different projects? Can I use prioritization options across two different across. projects? Yes. Well, there's a. Let me just get into project, and um, I'm going to point this out, but I'm not sure I'll be able to give a specific answer to that. So bear with me here. I'm going to. Whoops, sorry. I'm going to start project up so you can see it again. In general, in general, on the file tab and in options, you have two um, called a quick launch settings, uh, quick launches that determine the settings in project. This is where your configuration occurs. One is the schedule tab. One is the advanced tab. If you're asking, can I have multiple, uh, uh, multiple critical paths, as an example, then in project, I think it's in the advanced tab. Let me have a real quick. Yeah, well, here's some examples at the, on this ex advanced tab at the very bottom. Tasks are critical if Slack read that as float is less than or equal to zero days. That's going to help determine a critical path in a project. So if you want to have eaten up all of the capacity for a delay, then it's zero. If you want to be within two days, then you would change this to a two. And it gives you two days of time to buy, two days of, of buy time, if you will, or, um, or a buffer time before a task goes critical. And then the other setting, the one immediately above, above it, calculate critical, multiple critical paths. So if you are, if you're creating consolidated projects or if you're involved in multiple projects and they're, 
they're uh, sequencing issues with each other, then you may, may or may not want your multiple paths, um, multiple critical paths to show or not. But if there are sitting, settings that uh, are going to uh, need to be configured, just understand that they're in the Schedule tab as well as the Advanced tab. And, and just take the time to get in and look at them. Know that as you change settings, for example, where I'm pointing to general options for this project, the project that you're in will be named, but all new projects can be a possibility. So if you uh, don't like a setting and you want to change your default, schedule tab for an, as an example, drop down, to, uh, drop down to scheduling options for all new projects, and change it so that new tasks are auto-scheduled. Now, what that will mean is that new projects or new tasks in, in all projects from that point forward, or from the new projects from that point forward, will be auto-scheduled. It will not change the projects or the tasks that you currently have open or that you currently have um, in your project files. So for new, that's a new point. And again, this is a configuration, uh, if I understand the question, a configuration issue. Just know that the schedule quick launch or the advanced quick launch are going to contain the uh, options that are available for you to change the defaults of the tool. OK, let's see what else we got out there, John. I'm, I don't know if that and really. Back to that follow-up question, uh, Myra said, yes, the options and also the template that are underneath files. So, oh, yeah, sure. Uh, uh, you can get any. Oh, uh, give us your tips and tricks on that. Well. Let me uh, have just a second here. I keep having to go back to this control to start the uh, the seeing project again. Um, in in uh, in fact, in in project, if you were to look in your new uh, selection, project offers you some uh, existing templates. Uh, these are from, you know, not only just from from Microsoft, but also from, you know, organizations like ours, John, where um, they've been provided to the project team, software development plans, residential construction, on and on and on. There's, there's a, a um, I don't even remember how many, but there's a ton of these, uh, these out there and available. If you create your own template, like I do some in class, they're going to be under the personal templates, and you'll see. Well, here's some demonstrations. Uh, here's some templates for tasks or for projects that we used in training in March so far that are that are visible here. So, if you've gone to the trouble of saving a template that's uh, that's been useful for you, why uh, then this would be be the location you'll go to. Paying attention to these little headers here. These are actually tabs. They don't show as tabs, but they're different types of information. Under Featured, I would pay attention to new from an existing project if you can't, can't have or you don't have a template. If you're starting a project that you've done something similar for in the past, then start from that existing project if you know where it is so that you can, can proceed from that point forward. And, and you know, as you can see here, there's a, a multitude of potential project uh, forms, formats, templates, whatever you, you might want or whatever you might think you might need. And if you don't find one, well, find that project that w worked well for you and save that as a template. Now, what I'm saying is go to your Save As dialog find the, where you want to save your template. I'm just going to, uh, to uh, yeah, I'll just choose one here under, under templates as an example. But notice that the type that you can save is a project file, or further down the list, you can save a project template. And what uh, occurs at that point is once you select Save, it will bring up a, uh, a dialog that asks you if you want to strip anything out, like, for example, actual values or resource rates or baselines. Those types of things that make a project unique are not necessarily what you want in a template. But that's, that's all, that is what all will be available for you 
when you move into that save as mode. So good question, kind of a, a comprehensive question and uh, and a good one. You know, I think templates like other um, like other files in Office are always time savers. Yeah, and, and Sam, how about this? Do you have any don'ts do this for numbered baselines? So when you're working with uh, baseline numbers, do you have any don'ts? How many don'ts do I have? Okay, so let me go back here and I'll start a project again. Um, when you're using with baselines, dealing with baselines, you're all, it's in the project tab and set baselines. There are numbered baselines in the set baselines dialog, and there's unnumbered. A couple of things to keep in, in, in mind. One, the baseline that has no number is the one that project uses to compare with your schedule and determine variance. It is not using the numbered baselines. The numbered baselines um, are for well, historical reasons. You know, you start a baseline, and uh, you got your baseline made, and your boss says, hey, we're going to delay the project three months. Well, then that baseline, you may want to move into one of the numeric baselines. Here we go. Let me show this. We're setting an interim plan. We'll move the baseline into baseline one, and that will move uh, uh, out of the baseline fields, and bear in mind that's more than just dates, there's also work and cost involved, it'll move the, the, the fields values of the baseline into the numeric baseline. And at that point, it's now saved in baseline one. So you can change your schedule, modify the schedule to start three months later as, as your, your employer wants, and then reset the baseline for the project to that three, that three months later. Now you'll have both. You can then compare your baseline that you had originally to the baseline that you've got currently. And if you have to do it again, you can. In fact, you can do this, as you saw here, 10 times. And then, you know, from that point forward, you have luck. That's all the baselines you got available. So um, uh, in, in terms of these, the number of baselines and how they can be used, um, they're primarily useful in terms of, of, of uh, saving a historical value. Once you've got more than one baseline and you want to compare them, then you c there's a view called a multiple baselines Gantt. Go to the View tab, go to your drop-down into the Gantt chart, go to More Views, and there are all of the views that are currently available. And there's one called a multiple baselines Gantt. That will show you the three baselines that are most utilized, baseline 0, baseline 1, and baseline 2, so that you can look at them and, and determine um, where you started and then the interim baselines that you had uh, up through the baseline 2. Uh, we get more than, than three or four baselines in one of these charts, and it can get to be very, very confusing. So they are limited out of the can to baselines uh, 0, baseline 1, baseline 2. Is there another one out there before I jump into uh, back into the show there, John? Uh, what pops out to me is how do you level shared resources, but I don't know if we've got time to go on to that. I want to be sensitive to. Right. Uh, um, shared channel. resources, if it's a resource pool, you would level from the resource pool. Let me just say it like that. You know that you can have share files that pull in their resources from a resource pool. But leveling uh, in general and as a best practice would be conducted from the resource pool. Bear in mind, you can have 50 projects, including the resource pool, open. So the effect, you know, you want to make sure that the effect is what you want. You may also want to use those priorities, that priority field, if you uh, recall this, the priority field will help you as you start to level in multiple projects when you're using shared resources. So think about that. 
Yeah, John, I think we're just about out of time, aren't we? So let's uh, Yeah, let's we're at the stop. top of the hour. We've gone 90 minutes. I know there's a whole lot more uh, questions, and, and we answered as many as we could. So go ahead and wrap it up, Sam. Okay, so um, at the at, when we close this out, don't forget that there is a survey at the end of this event, and please fill it out. There will be another drawing. Now, this is not the one for the the uh, guide, this is for a full version of Microsoft Project Professional 2016. So please take the time to get into this uh, survey, answer the survey, and uh, good luck. I hope you, I hope you have a, a good shot at this. Now, I want to say thank you for attending. I appreciate very much your attending. I hope this was helpful. Um, if you feel like you want more, why please visit the blog, visit our website, um, send email, whatever you wish here, and we will do our very dead level best to assist you. So having said that, uh, thank you all.